Before we start, we would like to remind everyone that this webinar is for awareness and educational purposes only. This does not in any way replace the assessment and evaluation obtained from a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a duly licensed physician. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to BioBalance's first webinar for the year. Today, our topic is about these symptoms that has afflicted many. In an article published by BBC in 2019, said that this condition affects around one in seven people who are otherwise healthy. Symptoms range, range from abdominal discomfort, pain, bloating, flatulence, and infrequent bowel movement. This afternoon, our doctor speaker will talk about how we can manage constipation through proper nutrition and lifestyle practices. Our speaker is a resident consultant at BioBalance and is the first Filipino certified in functional medicine by the Institute of Functional Medicine in the USA. She is also European double board certified in nutritional medicine and anti-aging medicine. To help us understand more about constipation and how to address it, your viewers are presenting Dr. Stanley Chua. Thank you for that introduction, Mark. So for today, uh, we'll be discussing constipation. So that we'll define it, identify factors and, that affect the quality and the regularity of your bowel movement, and also how can we approach it at the level of our households and how we can approach it also on the side of, our, of the medical practitioner where you know, we, we're, we act like detectives and try to find out exactly what's going on. So people will define their constipation differently. So some people will define it by just simply by a lack of frequency. So having, you know, the, the more uh, scientific definition of constipation would be having less than three bowel movements per week. So that's almost uh, every, every other day. Um, and that's actually already quite concerning because every day we're eating and every day, of course, since we're eating, we cannot, you know, a lot of what we eat is also uh, waste. So we have to be able to eliminate every single day. Another way that we often define uh, constipation is that if our stools are hard, they are dry, lumpy, no? and sometimes, and oftentimes actually, stools that are difficult to pass or even painful at that time, at that. So having uh, the feeling also of not having all of the stool pass out every time we move our bowel movement is also one way that some of my patients actually define their constipation. And so I find that they, they tell me that, you know, they'd go at 7 a.m., but soon after 8 o'clock or 8 they have to go again. So it feels like, you know, they're not emptying completely. And it's really important to know which kind of constipation you have because it determines the course of action that you need to take. So there are two general classifications of constipation. There's the kind that happens occasionally, which happens probably you know, once every three months, once every six months, and it's usually quite short-lived. And it doesn't really affect any, any factor of life apart from that day that you had the constipation. The, what we need to discuss is are the people who are suffering from chronic, chronic constipation, meaning this is, this is the type of constipation that has lasted for at least three months or more. And, you know, a lot of my patients have, you know, they, they'll often tell me that, you know, I've been constipated since I was a child, you know, and that's really not normal. Um, oftentimes, people with chronic constipation also have effects that affect their work or their life. Um, and oftentimes as well, they do need certain medical attention, med a medication, a supplement that just to get them to have a bowel movement. And so, if you know already that you do have constipation, what defines then a good bowel movement or the ideal bowel movement? So it has often has the following characteristics. So there's a regularity with it. So five, six, seven times, preferably every day, hopefully. You have to have the urge to defecate. And so some people with constipation actually don't have the urge at all to move their bowels. And that's a big problem. They, oftentimes, you also need to be able to pass your stool within a few minutes of sitting on the bowl. It has to be easy to pass with little effort in pushing and absolutely pain-free. There must be no blood, mucus, or other substances or visible food in the, in the, in the stool to make, to make that stool or that bowel movement really the most ideal. So oftentimes, some people will see a piece of corn 
or or or, or some slivers of um, vegetables in their stool. So that means you didn't really don't really digest in that sense. It doesn't really have a bearing on constipation, but it just tells you that overall you're just probably not chewing your food or you know you're lacking certain enzymes in that regard. So there are several factors that do influence the regularity of a bowel movement. So food intake, which will be, we will go into more depth later, uh, having you know, too little or too much type of food, which, which we'll, put, uh, we'll discuss also as well, as well later. So there are certain foods that are quite constipating at that. The level of activity, medication, supplements that people take and can be constipating as well, and nutritional deficiencies. Uh, in particular, for nutritional deficiencies, magnesium, fats, oils, and fiber are the ones that are for bigger concern. Other factors that influence the bowel movement are microbial biodiversity, so what kinds of bacteria reside within the bowel, certain medical procedures that a person goes through, like surgery for the gallbladder, for example, or uh, if they've had colon surgery, usually um, creates um, a chance or a risk for them to be constipated. Certain medical conditions like diabetes and stroke and cancer are also uh, causes of, a, of, a, what, of a constipation. So if it's cancer, of course, the intervention needs to be surgical because most of the time the cancer causes blockages in the colon. Uh, with diabetes and stroke, uh, this, this would entail um, some neurophysiologic rehabilitation as well as management of the diabetes itself. Uh, in terms of lifestyle behavior, smoking seems to be the most uh, strongly linked to constipation. So mo more smokers often than not um, have constipation. So the type of food and the volume of food matters. So too little food, which we usually see in the elderly and anorexic individuals, uh, is a problem because if you're not eating much, there's not really much to put out. So, you know, uh, and, you know, if, you know, Oftentimes with, with elderly individuals, uh, the story is that they would just have one or two tablespoons of food and they feel really full already. And so you don't expect them to have a certain regularity of bowel movement if they're not really eating that much. On the flip side, if you're having too much food, too much food can overexpand the storage capacity of your large intestines and rectum and the stool becomes too big actually to pass easily enough. So these, they, these, this condition you often find in those that binge, binge eat quite a bit. So they eat tremendous amounts of food in a short period of time. And so that can be quite constipating as well. So certain foods uh, do, type, do cause constipation, right? So chocolate, red meat in particular because of the high iron content eating too many bananas. Um, so we do know that, oh yeah, if you're constipated, do eat a banana. But to a certain degree, if you eat too much of these bananas, the, the fiber in it can actually be quite constipating. Certain dairy products also can be quite constipating. And chilies in particular are probably the spice that really cause the most constipation uh, because they do often dry out the stool quite a bit. The lack of hydration is also a big problem. So I'm actually shocked by the by the response of my patients often that they, they don't drink enough, they drink one or two glasses of water for the whole day. Um, and so really, the, you know, they're not really even getting enough water to actually create the milieu that creates for the bulk of the stool, which is water. So the other factor that affects a bowel movement is, of course, movement. And so the more that you move, the more that you're able to move, the more stimulation you get uh, to your intestines. So regular physical activity often encourages more intestinal mobility and prevents intestinal stagnation. So having, you know, walking about 15 to 30 minutes after meals is actually a good idea because that does promote movement and that does promote intestinal uh, motility. So there are many, many supplements, many, many medications that can cause constipation. So the most common ones are antibiotics. Uh, all, almost all of the oral forms do cause some level of constipation in some individuals that are already at risk. Um, anyone who, who goes through chemotherapy, usually because of the action of those chemotherapeutic agents on the gastrointestinal lining. Iron, um, if you've ever had anemia and you had to take an iron supplement, um, constipation is always the biggest uh, uh, and most common side effect of that. 
antithyroid medication because you know if you're uh, not uh, if you're taking an antithyroid medication, you're actually trying to slow things down a bit. So that can cause um, constipation. So certain uh, uh, laxatives. So especially if there is a total reliance on laxatives, uh, so like, like Senna, for example, that can cause constipation because without that stimulus that you're getting, you're actually um, your your bowels become very very lazy. So there are nutritional deficiencies, and I mentioned this earlier. Magnesium deficiency is one. So magnesium actually helps with intestinal motility. And it's often one of the first line solutions uh, when we try to treat um, constipation. So a lot of people who go through diets, so ch children of the 60s, 50s, 70s, and 80s, uh, you know, fa low fat diets, low oil diets were the popular thing. And so a lot of them do have deficiencies in oils and fats or they have a certain fear about eating oils and fats and therefore um, will often refrain from eating them. Deficiency in fiber, I think this is across the population quite common. We don't eat, we don't eat enough vegetables anymore. And so our fiber uh, intake is quite poor. Poor microbial diversity, usually because of a poor diet, antibiotic use or steroids are the most common reasons for this. And so if you know, we're eliminating a lot of the microbes that inhabit us, uh, that usually causes some of those problems. So why even bother treating constipation? If we don't treat constipation or if we don't try to manage constipation, there is an increased risk for anal fissuring. So anal fissuring is basically, there's a wound in, uh, in the anal region and that, that can be quite painful and often causes bleeding. Most people, they know about hemorrhoids, right? And so hemorrhoids are ab abnormally large blood vessels um, in the anal region. And you know, they can be prone to heavy bleeding and cause a significant amount of pain each time you try to move your bowel. And so we want to avoid this problem. Fecal impaction is what we often see in uh, the pediatric age group. So a lot of kids, they try to hold um, their bowels and try not, to, uh, try not to want to move their bowel move to their bowels regularly. And so that action of holding it, you know, causes a lot of the stool to back up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if they hold it for too long, let's say they don't go for a week, for example, or two, um, it causes significant dis the, uh, disruption, significant pain and bloating and gas. And that, that often will need you, will cause you to actually go to the ER and have that impaction taken out. The other more, um, much more rare, condition that can happen with chronic constipation is a rectal prolapse. So in this case, it's the, the rectum actually uh, moves outside of its area and moves lower, sometimes outside of the anus. Um, and that's because the pelvic wall gets weaker. And you know the person is always constantly straining down. And so it's pushing that rectum lower and lower each time. And so you do it frequent cough uh, often enough, it, it starts to get lower and lower. And that becomes a surgical problem at that. So it's not a problem that's entirely uh, risk-free, you know. So there are significant risks, uh, whether in adults and in children. So the simple formula to manage most constipation is to give you the right food, the right nutrients, with the right bacteria, and the right stimulus. And we'll talk about the factors for each one. So the right food has to be food that has variety. So you know, we are creatures of habit and we often eat the same thing over and over again, breakfast, lunch, and dinner at that. And so oftentimes our diet's diversity is quite lacking. So having different nutrients, different food products every single day actually helps us to create uh, for a more complete diet, a more whole diet. At the same time, there is a less, there is significantly less risk for deficiencies in that regard. Apart from having good variety, so having good amounts of soluble and insoluble fiber. So vegetables in particular come to mind when we're talking about fiber fruits as well, especially bananas. Um, in terms of hydration, we need to provide sufficient hydration to every individual. And it means that each person needs to take 30 milliliters for every kilo of their body weight. So for example, I have a 70 kilogram patient, which is the average man, uh, he would need to at minimum take at least 2100 ml per day of water or 2.1 liters per of water per day and that does not include soup 
that does not include coffee, tea, soft drinks, etc. Okay. Um, and then lastly, is, you know, with more diversity of food, including nuts and seeds, you get more of the minerals, the magnesium, the zinc, the copper, and all of these things that can actually help uh, create a more balanced gut. The right nutrients entails that you need to take the right amounts of fiber. So make sure to take about 50, 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day, usually from vegetables or whole grains of that. Um, and the way that you know 25 to 30 grams would be per day uh, on a visual level would be that you need to take about eight to nine cups of vegetables every single day to get to that. Um, and often that's not realistic for a lot of people or they're so averse to the flavor of vegetables, for example. So a good shortcut that I always tell my patients is that try to try to turn it into a shake or you know, do some smoothies with that. And that often gets it out of the way. So once they do that for breakfast, lunch and dinner are quite easy because it's just one or two cups more for those two meals. So it's much, much more easier, much, much more manageable for them. The second thing that we need to do about the right nutrients is to have the right levels of magnesium. So the recommendation is around 400 milligrams of, roughly around 400 milligrams of uh, magnesium per day. Uh, and this is for adults, not for children. Uh, and food, of course, does contain magnesium. So you have old, uh, whole grains, you have green leafy vegetables, you have nuts uh, as good sources of those, uh, of those minerals. And so it's really key that um, to get enough of magnesium and just, not just magnesium at that, but magnesium plays the biggest role. Um, so 400 milligrams needs to be uh, in the right form as well. So if you're gonna take a supplement with magnesium, you need to have the right form. So if you're gonna to take a magnesium citrate, glycinate, uh, oxide, threonate, et cetera. So, but each type of magnesium, the, the, depending on the form, has a certain or a particular use. So the one that, most is most popular for constipation would be to use some form of a magnesium oxide. Uh, and that one will be mostly acting on the gastrointestinal level and just helping with the constipation and the movement. It doesn't do much of the other effects that you get from magnesium glycinate, for example, that you can have some of that relaxation effect, that calming effect, or with citrate that, you know, there's a little bit, it is a little bit more energizing, for example. So there's lots of other magnesiums out there. So just be sure to make to make the right choice as to which type of magnesium you need to use. Okay, so again, it's magnesium oxide that is usually the one that you need for just to handle constipation. Okay, but all the other um, mag types of magnesium, whether it's citrate, malate, glycinate, or malate, can all be used for the same purpose for constipation, plus the added benefits of you know what what each specific type can do for that person. It's also important to have a healthy intake of oils, right? So, you know, gone is the belief now that, you know, uh, fat-free is the way to go. Uh, keto is very popular, paleo is very popular, which are, you know, which are high in actually quality fats. And so, you know, having good amounts of avocado, avocado oil, butter and ghee and coconut oil, VCO, salmon, sardines, different kinds of fishes, nuts and seeds, no, they are all going to give you good fats. So it's, you know, we need to give you fats, but they, they shouldn't be the bad fats. You know, it's not all chicharron and lechon, you know, all the time. It's actually having good quality oils at the same time. The right bacteria means that we need to use quality nutrients. Qual sorry, quality bacteria that can actually replenish our microbial diversity, right? So oftentimes when I have patients with, um, with chronic constipation, I often would prescribe a probiotic. And usually the kind of probiotic I would use is a live probiotic. So these types of probiotics um, are already active in themselves. So once they enter your stomach, they, they are protected by that uh, capsule coating that, prevent, that prevents them from dying in the stomach. And then once they pass that and go into your intestines, the, the bacteria are already quite act, are already active as soon as they hit the intestines and free from the capsule. So that's, that's what makes them live probiotics. So uh, there's other probiotics in the market that you know they take they do need a little more time or they do need uh, uh, what because they, they they're, they're spore based for example that uh, they're not as many but they do uh, they do slowly wake up. No, it's not like when so they're they're active, but they don't 
work as quickly. So the live probiotics usually you'll feel uh, you'll feel it work almost within thirty to minutes to an hour upon taking it. And so that's why I like live probiotics for this case because it can work much faster. Uh, prebiotics are also a good um, supplement to use because prebiotics by definition are the food of the probiotics. So it helps your probiotics actually work a little bit better. Uh, and I like to use uh, prebiotics at the same time with probiotics, especially if there's a very poor uh, fiber uh, intake for that patient. So the right stimulus means we need to engage in regular activity. And you know the American Council on Exercise recommends at least 150 minutes per, per week. And you can split it how many ways. We can do it every you know, 30 minutes for five days a week, 45 minutes, three or four times a day, uh, three or four times a week, I mean. Um, so it's really just total of 150 minutes a week. But the more regular that you can be active on a daily basis, the better it would be. And that would help with digestive health overall. The second thing here is that you need to try to avoid using laxatives, especially becoming dependent on them. Because if you're trying, if you're very, very dependent on laxatives, Senna, for example, is common in a lot of slim, slimming teas. Um, you know, your bowel really becomes very, very lazy. And so, you know, all of these stimulants, they're super physiologic stimulants. You know, they create a tremendous amount of stimulation in the intestines, such that if, you know, the neck, if you become so reliant on this, your body's own natural stimulus for you to have a bowel movement will not ever be sufficient or will not reach that new threshold or that higher threshold to create that sense of a bowel movement. And so really the reliance on a laxative is not the way to go. Uh, we need to also learn to manage stress better. So stress creates the impression on your body that it's, it is under threat. It triggers that fight or flight response. And once that happens, basically it shuts everything down. It diverts blood flow and, and you know, the body just focuses on the heart, the brain, the adrenals, and the kidney. Uh, and those are the only organs that really need to work when you're under pressure and a lot of stress. And so what happens is that your digestive system starts to uh, quite, it's not, not, not as stimulated anymore. And that creates the, in, the environment no, to actually stop uh, to create that constipation that often very, very high strung, very, very stressed individuals experience. So if stress is a problem, you need to find a way to really decompress, um, really de-stress and just really manage that as well. So if these simple steps are not enough, of course we do recommend that you, know, you consult a doctor because there may be other factors that uh, have not been discussed here uh, that could be lead to your constipation. And oftentimes they will be often be able to weed out those issues. Uh, another way that we address constipation that's really you know, not run of the mill constipations that we often, I often would recommend the, my patients to have a stool test. And for that, we can look into certain factors like digestion, uh, how well they absorb their food or, or, or they're not absorbing their food at that what types of metabolic uh, efficiencies that the bowel has, does it absorb well? Does, you know, is there enough bacteria, for example? So in this example, you don't even see lactobacilli growing, for example. So you're able to actually create, create a picture of what exactly is inside the bowel that's causing you to have certain problems. And so you know, a stool test may be required, but it's not always the first step in my, in my, own, in my opinion. So, it's something that you, uh, is worth knowing right now. So don't ever give up, even when the going gets tough. So with constipation, you know, it's always important that we think that we need to have actually move our bowels very, very regularly because every day we're eating and every day, you know, there's lots of ways that our body has to put out as well. And so defecation is one of the main mechanisms by which our body gets rid of it. So if we're not able to move regularly, just imagine what kind of a wasteland our digestive system would be. So thank you. That's it for me for this afternoon. Turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you, Doc Stan, for sharing with us practical tips on how to literally relieve feeling blood. I can only imagine lighter and less bloated days ahead.
As a special treat to our viewers, we're giving an exclusive 10% discount for your online probiotics and supplement shopping. Just visit our website at www.biobalanceinstitute.com and use the promo code BALANCEGAT to enjoy your, your special discount. For those who want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Dr. Stan or any of our MD experts, drop us a message to our Facebook or Instagram page or you may also contact our hotline number at 0917-866-2689. Again, that's 0917-866-2689. As always, thank you everyone for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. If you have any particular health topic in mind, do drop us a note on our Facebook or Instagram page. Bye everyone!